Hey everybody, welcome to the Atheist Experience Live. It's Sunday, February 13th, 2011. I'm Matt D. Joining me, I'm not Matt D. <laughs> I'm Matt Dillahoney. Joining Your me this week is Jeff starts D. starts with a D. Hi everybody. I got so ahead, it's, you know, it's... <laughs> Well, you take a couple weeks it's off. It's truncated and opening announcements, so you're just yeah. going with an initial. Yeah, everything's shorter. I'm MD. That's JD. Let's go. Um, <laughs> take a couple weeks off, and everything just falls apart. We've had notorious problems with the uh, the sound equipment here, the telephones, uh, the audio. It's been plaguing us. I even made a post on the blog, which I'll go ahead and promote. Uh, atheistexperience.blogspot.com for more information about that. We've been working on it. Hopefully things will go a little bit better today. I got in and, and did some tweaking and we spent a lot of time on the phone so we're, we're kind of optimistic. But let's get the general announcements out of the way first. This is a live public access television program sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism in the separation of church and state. The ACA has weekly meetings every Sunday at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road beginning at around 1130 except for the first Sunday of the month when we have our lecture series at the Austin History Center beginning at 1215. Um, we had we were supposed to have a board meeting this morning, uh, but there's a lot of conflicts. There's a lot of stuff going on. We've got people getting married, which includes me, uh, in October. So Yay. yeah, I wish you all could come, but there's a limited room and I can only afford to pay for so many people to eat and dance and drink and engage in all sorts of debauchery. But uh, the uh, the other program sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin is the Nonprofits, and you can find out more information at nonprofitsradio.com. That's P R O P H E T S. That program is now a weekly uh, internet podcast that ends up being bi weekly. See, it used to be bi weekly, and when we cancel one, you'd get one a month. And now it's weekly, so that when we cancel one, you get one every other week or so. <laughs> so it, it's this big kind of deceptive uh, marketing campaign. But we're weekly. We just didn't have one yesterday. <laughs> we're trying. And we're hoping to get Jeff to come out on a Saturday when he has time to kind of return to the olden days of nonprofits. It hasn't we... been that long since I did a nonprofits. No. I did one during the hiatus. Yes. With, I'm just uh, in, with I'm, Russell and, and, and Linnea. I'm just encouraging you to swing back over some Saturday when you don't have, when you, you know, yeah. nothing better to do. But uh, after the show's over, we get together for dinner. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come to any of our events. You don't have to be a member to attend. Currently, we're going to El Arroyo. I'm sure that they'll put the address up there on the screen here in just a second. Um, there's one other announcement about an upcoming event. You can find, by the way, if you go to atheist-community.org, that's the website for the ACA, there's a calendar, frequently asked questions you can, page. You can find information about our blood drive, happy hours on Thursdays, any of the other events. Um, but there's a special event coming up that a lot of people are participating in. And you can go to savetxschools.org for more information. On March 14th, there's a rally at the Capitol. Um, regarding the state of public education in Texas and the funding and the school books and uh, all the information's there. I, I've been kind of partially out of the loop, but we're planning on, on going down and participating as well. Um, but if it's your sort of thing, and uh, as I would think it's many of our viewers sort of thing, I wanted to make sure we got the information out. That's all. I want to add one thing about the that atheist I have, community. And Jeff has one thing. I want to have, add one thing about the atheist-community.org site. Yeah. You can find out who's going to be on on what day. Our schedule is there. I've yeah. lost track of the number of times people have accosted me on Facebook to ask me when I'd be on next. And honestly, <laughs> I don't keep very good track, as some of you may have noticed. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but you can find out the exact same way I do, which is by going and looking at the freaking schedule. That one, that schedule, though, is at atheist-experience.com. Okay, a the, the but, website but, for the TV but, show. But you can link to atheist. Yes. Uh, experience from atheist community. The grand irony, of course, is that it's it's Jeff's forgetting that he was on one day is the whole reason I was on the show in the first place. So <laughs> I happen to be here. It's helping an opportunity. It's not a mistake. It's an opportunity. Yeah, we're, we're doing whatever we can to help people. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and jump into callers and see if the phone lines are working and what all we can get done on calls today. Um, and I'll get some more information out as the show goes on. So we've got Damon in Glasgow. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hi, Damon. Not too bad. How are you guys? Good. I, I take it you can hear us well? Uh, I can, yes. Can you hear me all right? Great. Yeah, you sound fine. Okay. Uh, well, Happy New Year, by the way. It's all the fun. Um, I know it's quite late into the New Year, but Happy New Year to all. Oh, I thought um, you were going with the, like the Chinese. Nuptials, I just heard. Yes, thanks. 
Um, I was just wanting to ask, I actually called uh, a few months ago, I don't know if you remember. Oh, I, I might remember. Uh, I'm from Greece originally. I was just talking about how crazy the situation is over there. Ah, doesn't matter anyway. I, 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 was, I, I couldn't hear what you said. No, um, I'm, I'm originally from Greece. I'm, in, I'm yes. in the UK now, but I'm originally from Yeah, Greece. and you were talking about the education system in Greece, that's right. That's the one, yes, and I remembered you, just a little segue, because you mentioned about the education system in Texas and the situation there. Um, this is a question I've got uh, also pertaining to education. I, was, um, I, work, uh, I work for the courts here in Glasgow. Um, I actually studied law, and um, I've noticed that, um, especially with the, uh, the people I deal with, because uh, I, I also handle a lot of cases for Greek-speaking defendants, quite a bit as a translator, mm -hmm. and um, I've noticed that there's uh, a great amount of people who... Um, depending on how religious or non-religious they are, is um, kind of, not exactly directly proportionate, but does seem to play a, a rather large part in how easy they are to commit a crime and in how, how, how easy they are to re-offend and their lack of rehabilitation in the, um, um, in, the, in, uh, in the prison system, from what I've noticed. And um, I was talking about this with um, some colleagues of mine and uh, some practicing lawyers who are friends of mine who have been in the business for quite some time, uh, fellow atheists themselves. They seem to think that um, a great deal of uh, how many people will reoffend has got to do with whether or not they hold any religious belief of um, forgiveness from a higher power. So if they if they honestly believe that no matter what crime they commit uh, in this life, as long as they ask for forgiveness from well Jesus Christ apparently because we're a, we're a Christian society up here, if they honestly believe that they can be forgiven by their higher power, then they really in a sense they lack any real appreciation of what they do in this life. So. Sure. I was wanting I was wanting your guys' opinion on that because I thought to myself that that would actually be a very interesting thesis proposal for a PhD perhaps to do, to see, to take maybe statistics. Of course, I know statistics aren't always very accurate, and a lot of it's got to do with um, socioeconomic situations of people. But um, from what I've read, from what I've um, researched a little bit here in the EU, I've noticed that a lot of countries that are mostly uh, very secular, mostly atheistic, or very non-theistic, like the Scandinavian countries, Holland and Germany, they've got a much lower crime rate percentage um, um, compared to countries like the United States or the United Kingdom that have a greater deal of uh, religious people than what they do. And I was just wondering what your guys' opinion on that is. Sure. Jeff? Yeah. You got I think I just, the, as you were talking, the thing that struck me is um, I'd, I'd be wondering whether these theistic um, multiple offenders who believe that, it, that, the, that they can get their forgiveness directly from their God. I wonder if they're you know, more resentful of the legal system and of you know, the, the state incarcerating them for their crimes than, than other uh, criminals on account of they believe they've already been let off the hook by their God. I'm just curious what their attitude would be. About that. And I think that, you know, while it's, it's definitely an interesting subject, I mean, we've seen other kind of statistical analysis of uh, the prison population with, compared to religions. Um, I think the biggest problem you're going to have is, is you're never going to be able to do more than demonstrate a correlation. I mean, you can't, it's going to be really difficult to try and say that the reasons for their recidivism is directly tied to your your proposition um, that religion, a religion that offers forgiveness may impact um, an individual's, or may significantly impact an individual's understanding of personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't know that, I don't know that you can get to a sort of causal conclusion at all, but I think the correlation is probably strong enough, especially when you have uh, religious people who would be shocked by those numbers that, you know, uh, if, if they're advocating a position that their religion necessarily makes someone more moral, et cetera, um, then showing that, in fact, there's a negative correlation between religiosity and um, how likely someone is to uh, properly pay for their uh, crime, serve their time, and then never uh, re-engage in that activity again. I think that would surprise a lot of people. It's an interesting thesis that I'd, you know, I'd certainly like to see you know, the, the research done, um, and I think there's a lot of potential strong arguments no matter what the results are. Um, it's, it's certainly interesting information because it may turn out to be the case that amongst uh, specific religions, 
the rate of recidivism is in fact lower. Um, and that would be an interesting starting point to go and figure out exactly why. Is there any way to tie this to, for example, uh, the potential truth of the supernatural aspect of, of their claims, or is there something else about the the uh, sociological aspects of that religion and that culture um, that in, you know that encourages, uh, uh, I guess, a proper repentance or a proper you know uh, rehabilitation when that happens. So I don't know, but it's it's definitely an interesting question to pursue. Because um, the other thing, I mean, I, I didn't study personally, uh, I, did, I haven't studied uh, much science myself, but from what I did read on the, on the evolution of the human species, I saw that um, um, the, uh, obviously what, what must have happened is that uh, humans, the first humans, grouped together and saw, that, uh, saw how beneficial it was for them to, uh, against other predators uh, to be in a close-knit society and how they'd, um, and effectively all humans today, or the majority of humans today, were actually descended from those from those first groups of people who realized the benefits in being nicer and more cooperative as a society. So at the same time, I'd like also to perhaps link this, this whole notion of um, altruism is not in any way um, given by a higher power, as a lot of people will say, well, where your morality comes from, obviously, if you feel doing something bad, if you, so if you feel that you hurt someone or you kill someone, and you feel bad about it, where does that guilt come from? And I'd, I'd like to, I mean, from what I've read, it seems to me that it's not just how you were raised, but also an intrinsic um, knowledge of being, of, um, an, an, an intrinsic understanding of doing harm, because um, it's obviously it's an evolutionary trait, I feel. So well, yeah. from that point of view, I'd like to knock down this whole, uh, this whole um, argument that oh, well, obviously if you feel bad about having hurt someone, then that's, that's God speaking to you rather than your conscience or rather than your own biological imperative. Right. You know, there's, harming others is, is detrimental to you, detrimental to the society around you. Right. There's been, there's been quite a bit of research done in this area, and, and while I can't come up with the names off the top of my head, I've looked into a couple of books on this. Um, and, you know, it's, I don't find it surprising at all. That, or, to me, it's a simple answer, um, a, as you've kind of touched on, that uh, understanding the benefits of a cooperative society, understanding that you don't live in a bubble where your actions don't affect anybody, all of our actions interact, and the fact is that we've developed essentially uh, empathy and the ability to understand how our actions are going to affect other people based on how they may affect us. I can put mm -hmm. myself in the position of someone who has lost a child, for instance, even though I haven't. Now, do I understand it fully? No, I, mean, I, I don't probably grasp it at the level that, that they are currently engaged in it, um, but I can at least um, come up with kind of a hypothetical that allows me to be empathetic and, and sympathetic towards their, their situation. Uh, I, I think that the, while it would be nice to see even more research in this area, I think at this point it, it's clear that the burden of proof for people, and, and even before, the burden of proof for people who claim that this is some kind of uh, God poking, you know, the, that your conscience is entirely some sort of supernatural being prodding you when you don't get it right. I, I think that they haven't remotely made their case and there's no reason to presume that they could possibly be right. I, I'd like to add that um, much of the, the, most, the earliest um, archaeological evidence of religious practice, you know, in, in prehistoric times, has to do with venerating say the you know the remains of a bear that the tribe killed and ate and you know modern versions of this um, you know we know that that that's that's all about apologizing to the bear for having killed it and um, uh, and in what it, it it strikes me that what this is is and that humans have an innate impulse of empathy that even extends to animals. And the purpose of the ritual is to get past that so that you could eat big tasty animals and not feel so bad about it because, oh, well, you know, we did the little ceremony and we, we, we buried it with veneration, so we're not doing anything wrong. It seems, well, seems, seems much of the function of religion is, in, is, is specifically to set aside our natural empathic impulses and give ourselves the permission to do um, uh, to do more violent things. Well, I mean, that's, that's how I've seen uh, 
that's how I see what religion's position really is in most people's minds. It's just uh, it's um, it's a it's a get out of jail card. It's a free get out of jail free card in the sense the ultimate get out of jail free card because no matter what they do, if they honestly believe it, at the end of it, they can be forgiven simply by believing in. Because I mean, I've, right. I've yet no. to meet a because at university there were quite a few Christian societies, and we tried to because I I, um, I started the um, atheist society at my old university. And um, we tried to get into um, a few debates and a few discussions with them. We, we, we didn't get any takers, apparently, because they wanted to talk to us beforehand and see what we were like. But uh, the main thing I got from all of them was they were unrelenting to budge on the issue that whether or not you're a good person is completely immaterial. You had to have believed you had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And when I tried to explain to them that from my point of view, that just seems like it's, it, it just gives people free reign to do whatever they want as long as they believe in something, then obviously they can never, they can never truly be good people. And they can truly never, uh, you know, get out of this sense of guilt that they have if they hadn't, if they didn't have that little loophole. It, so, uh, to, be, to be fair, you know, um, the uh, other forms that this takes are like, you know, our, your child has died and you're, you're, um, you're suffering from grief and believing that kind of thing that that the child had a soul and the soul had gone on to a happier place and all that. I mean, that, that's hard to point fingers at, harder to point fingers at and say, you know, that they're just trying to get out from, um, from having to face up to their, their natural human impulses. I mean, um, that, that's more understandable. But, uh, yeah, now we're getting into the territory of, of, of hell and the us versus them mentality and, you know, if you're not one of us, then you're, a, then you're an evil sinner automatically, no matter how, how you actually behave. Yeah, and, and, and I, that's a much longer call. Maybe we should. Yeah, and, and actually we're going to move on after this, but I want to make the, the point that you have to be careful that we don't oversimplify um, the, the positions. First of all, Christianity isn't one thing. It's not any... Um, Despite having a unifying label, it's not um, even a collection of unifying doctrines within, for example, Protestants, let alone Protestants, Catholics, etc. Um, and there are, I think, I think most Christians, and, and I would have at the time, uh, would look at what you're saying and say that, you know, there's this, there's this kind of, in addition to the loophole of the get, ultimate get-out-of-jail-free card, that applies at an ultimate level. It doesn't apply at the localized earth level. Um, and there are plenty of verses and doctrines that encourage people to behave within Christianity, behave in a way um, that is conducive to a productive society. There are also some that, you know, aren't, when, you know, as long as you've got a book that's going to advocate slavery and the subjugation of women, etc. But the idea that you become completely free of your responsibility for the actions you take on earth is not um, any kind of clear tenet. Now, you may be dealing with this on another level where um, the individuals develop this idea of, you know, oh yes, I did this wrong, but God forgave me. And so it develops this sort of uh, lack of responsibility for actions. And, and, and as secularists, obviously, we don't have that. I understand that when I do something to somebody, um, I am responsible. There's nobody to, you know, I need to, if anything, I need to get the forgiveness of the individual who I've wronged and not some third party who may or may not exist. But you have to be careful when you start talking about Christianity as one thing or even a particular doctrine as being universal. Um, I'd be interested in the results of actual data, but not so much on the the speculation as to whether or not um, this rep well i don 't think this represents a significant portion of the christian community this i I think most people, um, despite being Christian or despite being whatever uh, religion might fit this particular doctrine, uh, generally understand the nature of being a decent person and that people are responsible for their actions. Um, so I, I'd be a little cautious, but certainly there's some interesting stuff there to to, to start investigating. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, guys. Sure. Thanks for your call. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. We've got, is it Kevin in Corpus Christi? Yeah, hello. Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm all right. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Fine. That's good. Um, I just have a quick question for you, and then I'm probably just going to get off. Okay. Uh, 
I just want to know if either of you or both of you, whichever, uh, are anti-theists, and if uh, any of you think or are certain that gods don't exist. Sure, I'm an anti-theist, and I'm not certain in the, abs in the sense of absolute certainty that a god doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, I, I'm an anti-theist as well, and I, I, I'm, I claim to be certain that gods don't exist. Uh, I can't really absolutely prove that they don't, but uh, I, just, I just make that claim that I'm certain that they don't exist. It, it depends very much on the on the definitions. Um, on, on, wow, that's what an interesting screen. <laughs> I'm as certain as I can be about a great many of them. Yeah, uh, infinite regression being one of the things that I find to uh, invalidate the possibility of gods. Well, it it potentially invalidates the possibility of some gods. That's the problem: is that there's as many different god hypotheses as, as there are people almost. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have your take? Uh, I, I don't think I'd characterize myself as an anti-theist because I can imagine, uh, you know, uh, given free reign to make up whatever I want to think about, you know, I can imagine a god who'd be a really awesome guy who'd, um, who would not, who would exist without demanding any worship and stuff. Um, I am anti-theism Sure. Right. I, I think no matter how nice of a god I can imagine, I would not worship it. I might appreciate it. I might say, hey, dude, thanks. But, um, but taken to the level of like meeting once a week for organized, um, you know, bowing and scraping, I, I would be against that. Uh, and as for my certainty as to whether gods exist or not, again, like Matt said, it all depends on the definition. I, if I meet some South Seas Islander and he points to his totem pole and, and says, that's my god, then, you know, I really don't have a lot of choice. I say, okay, your god exists. He's that hunk of wood over there. Th and then we get into questions about whether that hunk of wood has the magical powers that he attributes to it, but that's a separate question. Yeah, yeah I'm just, uh, I'm just mainly talking about uh, like magical gods, magical uh, entities that are supposedly outside space and time and don't need to be created by any separate process, things like that. Yeah. Sure, it's, and, and I, I'm kind of with Jeff, I think we're talking about the same thing, but you know, quibbling a little bit over labels in that, sure, I could probably imagine uh, something that would qualify as a god, which I'm perfectly happy with. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to the idea of God, just as I'm not opposed to the idea of an afterlife. But of the gods that have been presented and considered, um, I'm opposed to them as, I'm, I use anti-theist in the way to mean that it goes a step beyond atheism, which is, I don't believe in any gods. Um, I believe, in fact, there are no gods, to, at least with regard to the ones that I, I've considered, uh, etc. cetera. Um, in, 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 in what I would consider in any meaningful sense of the word, um, I don't see any likelihood that there are gods. I'm actually more anti-religionist or religion than, yeah. than anything. Agreed. I'm opposed to, the, to worship just as a concept. I, I, I find it absolutely absurd that even if a god existed that it would need, want, or expect Worship. I mean, that just, that's just absurd to me. Um, and likewise with, you know, concepts of sin and other things. But all right, we're going to go ahead and try and get some more callers in. I appreciate it, Kevin. All right. Thanks for the reply. Sure. Thanks. We've got Timothy in Mobile. Hello. How you doing, Timothy? Hey, um, I just want to say first off, just right off the bat, I uh, just started watching you a couple of days ago. I've been watching back stuff on YouTube, and mm -hmm. I think you'll have the patience of the saint for handing some of the apologetics that just continuously get thrown over and over and over again. I, uh, it's just, it's, I, I want to bang my head on my keyboard sometimes. It's a good thing I'm not Catholic then, because I wouldn't be able to donate my organs, which is something I'm actually looking forward to. Well, and I'm not looking forward to it. Like, <laughs> let's go get we this. We all are, now. Matt. We're all looking forward to you donating your <laughs> organs. <laughs> I've had my eye on certain body parts of yours for quite some time. Oh, oh wow, my. that sounded wrong. <laughs> All right, so Timothy has a, an issue. Yes, Tim. <laughs> uh, you, well, yeah, it's, see, it's really weird. I've had this job. I've worked at this cafeteria in town where I live uh, for about three and a half years. Sure. And there was this old woman that I used to work with, and we were really good friends. Um, and, I mean, she knew I was an atheist, and I knew she was kind of a devout Christian. She, she wasn't married, but she had a boyfriend that she had lived with for a long time. 
And we were actually really good friends. You know, we shared personal secrets. I would help her out with money. Sometimes she would help me out with stuff. Sometimes, you know, we, we were just, we were friends, and we worked together. And her boyfriend died in a car accident. He had a heart attack and died wow. uh, about six months ago. And ever since that happened, she's become this kind of, I think she, uh, this is just my supposition, but I just feel like she's become afraid of death. And she's can't, it's like she can't deal with it anymore. She used to be a really carefree person, but she's, she's kind of lost this, there's something missing that's keeping her tied to reality. You know, she's still there kind of mentally, but it's kind of hard to explain. But basically what it amounts to is she suddenly has this huge problem with me being not a Christian. And to the point where it's starting to interfere with my job, and actually ended up having to put in my two weeks' notice and find another job, because wow. I tried to talk to my boss about it, and I figured my boss would be, you know, she's my boss, she should know better. And one day, this old woman had tried to convert me on the spot, and I kind of tried to shut it down because I'm like, we're at work, you know, let's not do this, you know, not a place for that. And she kept coming at me, and I would try to walk out of the room, and she would follow me. And so I had brought it up to my boss, and she did the same thing to me. Wow. And she was she started, you know, well how did you how do you think the universe got here? You know, uh well how you saying we came from monkeys and that sort of stuff and I was and I just finally said, All right, you know what and I let it go. But um I was asking a lot of people for advice though and I went to a forum that I visit regularly for once some band I like and people were talking about how they would handle it and they were basically giving me advice which is pretty much what I was already doing, that I should keep it low and let her be the one that makes it about religion. You know, and just deal with my job and do my job so that they can't. Because she's just she's just looking for things to say about me to cheapen my work, you know, my image at work and try to make me look bad. And so I figured, and that's what I did. And, and I left on good terms with that job. I was just kind of wondering. I mean, I don't really know what y'all do outside of this. I don't know much about y'all. But like, if you were in that position, how would how, would you have handled that any differently? Or is there anything you think maybe I should have done differently, or that I would, you know, if I were to encounter that in the future? Did you were did you have any trouble getting the new job? Um, no, so far it went really good. I went to an interview today then, then I don't see, Then I don't necessarily see what the problem is. You know, I mean, it, uh, how, so, how a person should handle that situation depends on what, you know, who that person is and what their situation is. And sometimes, you know, you've got the freedom to make a quick jump like that to another place of work and, and it all works out fine. And other times, you know, if you're trapped, you probably don't want to make a lot of waves. You know, you see what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. if it worked out for you, then you probably did the right thing. Yeah, there's a, depending on the situation, I mean, there's potential for a lawsuit. But I'm not, I'm not lawsuit happy, and I'm not convinced that that's, you know, necessarily the best thing in, yeah, I'm in, really not in big most on that either. situations. I mean, I'm in a position, um, in the tech industry, things are a little more, volatile than others and I've been unemployed a number of times over the past 10 years and if I think my first steps if somebody was was uh, overtly proselytizing at work would be to talk to them about it and you know say hey look I'm just trying to focus on my job I'm really not interested in this and I don't think that, that, that the workplace is the t you know the place to bring it up um, and if it I think I'd do mostly the, pretty much the same thing you did uh, the curious thing is that you're right. Your your boss should actually know better, um, and you should have been able to get support from your employers to in order, you know, for you to have a a, a healthy, happy work environment. Um, but absent that, sometimes just packing your bags and leaving and finding another job uh, is unfortunately the best option. Um, so yeah, that's that's about all I got. Oh, that's cool. I mean, that's definitely reassuring. <laughs> I just, I, I keep, I'm kind of in the in-between stage right now, and I've just been having some second thoughts, because I really do enjoy this job that I had, and I really enjoyed a lot of the people that I worked with, and I met a lot of cool people through it, and I, just, I guess I'm kind of having a sort of buyer's remorse about my new job, because I know it's the right thing to do. I mean, I know deep down that, you know, ever since I decided, look, I'm going to do this, I know that that's what I'm going to do, but at the same time, I keep kind of going, I, I'm, I'm kind of a punching bag like that, like, eh. Like you were saying about the lawsuits and stuff, you know, a lot of my friends were telling me, oh, that you can sue people over that. And I'm just like, to me, I'm kind of trying to fight the angry, lawsuit, happy, atheist stereotype because we don't have a lot of people out here that are open because we're in the deep south. Sure. And I just, actually, how it all started was I had gone to this convention. There's this guy, Hemet Mehta. He has yeah. a blog, Friendly Atheist. Sure. That, um, yeah, I know Hemet. He had this book, book signing. I got to meet him, and I was real excited. And I had gone to work, and I wasn't even going to say anything about it. But um, this lady had asked me what I had done this weekend, and I kind of tried to dance around the atheist thing, and I eventually ended up bringing it up. I was like, oh, he's just this, you know, he's this atheist guy that does this. And she's like, what's that? And she stuck on that word, and then that was the end of it, and I never, she never, ever got over it. Yeah, and, and I don't dance around it. 
because having asked people at work, hey, what'd you do this weekend? Um, they never seem the slightest bit wary about saying, oh, you know, I went to church and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And I, I should be able to, to respond similarly. You know, okay, I, you know, I did the TV show or I went to this lecture um, and then let's just kind of move on from there. Because when they say, oh, I went to church, I don't ever go, you went to church? Why would you do that? <laughs> I mean, and yet the, the, re the reaction that I get is completely different. Um, it's kind of like, oh, you know, yeah, let, let me that. back off a little bit. Um, I, I think, I think by and large, you did the right thing. I think there's another option too: is that if you really liked the, the place where you worked, and you liked a lot of people there, it'd be worth finding out how many other people there that you liked felt similarly and were disappointed that you're no longer working there. Because getting a few people, uh, perhaps since your boss wasn't going to support you, getting a few other people of your of your coworkers to support you and say, "Look, uh, you know, he just wants to work here. What, why do we have to to try and preach to Timothy every time he shows up? Why can't?" You know, we just let him work here and leave the religion stuff out of this um, because we'd rather not see him leave and you guys are going to drive him away. Um, it would be nice to get some support like that. It's not always easy. Um, and I, you know, I've said before for people who have asked, you know, should I come out or how should I come out? Uh, should I tell anybody? If you think that, you know, your life is going to be worse off afterwards, then you don't have to say, you don't ever have to say anything, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, there are plenty of out atheists. Uh, well, there's not. Yeah. There's not we, plenty. We, we but there's get, enough to make up for the people who can't. We we get judged enough by Christians all the time. You know, uh, isn't that enough? Do we need to be like judging one another's <laughs> behavior yeah. in situations like this too? I mean, come on, let's relax. And do, do the thing that makes sense to you. You know, you can ask for advice. That's fine. But ultimately, you know what your situation was and what you needed to do. And um, and if it worked out for you, great. Yep. All right, so thanks a lot, Timothy. I uh, All right. hope your new job works out better for you. That's cool. And just and Chloe, just real quick, I wanted to say um, I really do like that y'all deal with the, a lot of the apologetics that people have because I've been a lot more confident in saying, okay, that's what I believe because I know I'm like, yeah, you know what, that makes sense when he says that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I just, I'll be watching. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. All right, thanks, bye. Appreciate it. All right, as a reminder, after the show's over, we're doing dinner. We all, wow, this new hour format just goes by so fast. We're halfway do we, done. Do we have a Christian on the line um, at all? Yeah. Can we um, go that one? Yep. Yay. So uh, after the show's over, we're going to go to El Arroyo for dinner. It's at 1624 West 5th Street near Mopac. Um, there's the information. And we're on the air till 530, and we'll be over there around 6 o'clock or so. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to join us. We've got Mark in Austin. How are you? Hi, Matt. I'm glad I got... I'm glad I got to talk to you this time. I tried to get to last show, but you weren't on. Can, can we uh, get that? There's, it's like overly loud right here, so I don't know if... I can, can you hear me? I can hear you. I had a difficulty understanding. You said, hey, they're going to turn this down, and we'll, we'll try it one more time. Go ahead and talk, Mark. Can you hear me this time? Hello? Hello. Yeah, keep going. Okay, um, I am from a church... And hello, hello. Now we lost him. Okay, you know, we lost you him. You know that's that's curious because I haven't been able to catch up on the last two shows. Uh huh. Um, but evidently, last week there was some kind of disconnect, and there were people who thought that you know we hung up on them. There were other people who thought they hung up on us. I don't know what the disconnect was. Um, I, w I haven't seen the last two shows, but people are like, oh, you know, this Mark guy from I don't know, Stone Church or whatever uh -huh. um, is likely to call back in, and I've been looking forward to actually talking to him. Uh, Mark, if we can't get the phones to work and you can't get back in, uh, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to come visit your church. I'm happy to sit down with you otherwise. We can, you know, certainly work something out. Um, and I apologize, although I don't seem to be having problems with other calls, so I'm not quite sure. Let me take another Austin call just... And, and by the way, um, the guy screening the calls, when you're talking to him, find out if they're on a cell phone or a landline, because I want to get some data as to which ones cause the most problems. But, so we got Jerry in Austin. How are you? We got Jerry in Austin. How are you? Jerry. Uh, you know? I'm good. How about you? Yeah, you're, you're going to turn down your, your TV. Yeah, you're, you're going to turn down your Oh, okay. Sorry. Because I get the echo there. <laughs> we'll just All right. Us. Sorry about that. Sure. How you doing? Uh, good. How about you guys? Pretty good. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, what are you guys' opinion on, like, religious people who try to, like, bring their religion onto you, I guess? 
We're against that. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> do you just think that they're pretty stupid? Or uh, that's. Uh, I think most of them are probably well-meaning. Like Christians. Sure. I think most of them. I have the majority of my family's Christian. Um, I think most of them are well-meaning and and hopelessly misguided. Um, but I don't mind so much people trying to do what they feel is right for somebody else as long as they know when to stop, for example, when you say, hey, I'm, you know, I don't want to have this discussion. Um, and I, my primary objections are when they continually work to legislate their religious opinions onto others, when they attempt to deny people rights or change the way the world works. Uh, or channel into their... government funds to support their views. Yeah, or like yeah. saying that you're living your life wrong. Yeah. No, I, that, that one really gets me. Yeah. I don't. I don't much care for that. I, I, yeah, I think, I think it's, I mean, I'm just asking because uh, I had a my ex girlfriend's dad would always get talk to me about it, and he would just say like he knows the word and all this stuff. And sure, does he know anything other than the word? <laughs> no. Yeah, that's the problem. I just, I just <laughs> yeah. don't understand personally. I don't understand why folks want to throw up these artificial um, barriers between themselves and other people so that you know if you're not in our group if you don't believe in our our magic holy book then you can't be friends you know i, I, just, I don't understand why people want to do that on purpose yeah it's hard enough to 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 keep and maintain close relationships with people whose core values are significantly different from yours it's even harder when they absolutely refuse to um avoid the discussion about it, or it, I guess that's not the right way to phrase it. Um, it's harder when they are constantly trying to push those views upon you. I don't mind so much if somebody says, um, well, you're not living your life the way God wants you to. Okay, I, why, you know, I have no reason to think that your God exists or care about how he wants me to live my life. Isn't it my life? Um, you know, make a demonstration that this God actually exists, and then maybe we can work on whether or not I care how he thinks I should live my life. Um, so it, it doesn't, it, it annoys me, don't get me wrong, it certainly annoys me that somebody, um, well-meaning people will tell each other, give each other advice about how they should live their lives or give their opinion about what, what they think someone else should do or shouldn't do. That's fine. It's great when it's asked for and desired. And when somebody doesn't want your opinion, <clears throat> maybe you shouldn't give it. But if you've given your opinion, and somebody disagrees with you and asks you for some sort of rational, evidence-based reason why they should agree with you, and you can't come up with it, now you've crossed the line over into right. proffering delusions. That, that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, it, 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 if people are going to criticize me or give me advice, they should at least have some justification for the criticism or the advice they're giving me, right? Otherwise, they're just, you know, saying negative things to me and wasting my time without being able to um, give me any reason why I should have heard, you know, heard from them in the first place. Yep. And, and on that note, Jerry, we're going to let you go. I think Mark's actually back. Uh, All right. He's fixed his phone problem. Thanks for your so call. Thanks for calling. All right, thank you. Cheers. Hey, Mark, you there? I'm sorry, can you hear me now? I yeah, can. we could before. We just okay, had... I'm sorry. And last time I called the show, that was um, a mistake on my part, too. No okay, worries. Um, we're just glad so... to get it sorted. So what's up? Well, um, I actually uh, go to church here in Austin, and uh, there's been a, a bit of a, a discussion uh, about your show lately at my church, and um, there's actually been a lot of concern, um, because uh, I don't know uh, which church you guys uh, went to, uh, but uh, we're, pretty, we're pretty much by the book. Um, and, uh, sure, I was, and I was primarily Southern Baptist. I went to a handful of Pentecostal churches from time to time, but almost exclusively Southern Baptist. Okay, and, and, and what, 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 did, um, what did your church say about blasphemy? Um, I went to a number of different churches. I don't necessarily know that... I, I, I don't know that, that blasphemy was specifically discussed in a way that I remember. I understand that, you know, it's, it's a sin and that apostasy being the potentially unforgivable sin and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, blasphemy was wrong. Mm-hmm. And uh, if if, uh, if 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 when you were at church, if there was a show like um, like your show, what would you have thought about it? Do you think? You know, I thought about that a lot, and I and I'm I'm really not sure. 
um, because I can no longer view this show through the lens that I used that I would have once viewed it through. I can I can do a pretty decent job of of thinking about how I might have looked at it. Um, I probably would have been. Um, concerned about the effect that it might be having on people. I mean, my parents think that I'm working for Satan, leading people to hell. Um, so, you know, I can kind of use their, their assessment mm. as a barometer. Mm. And I would have been concerned for the souls of the individuals on the show, um, you know, for fear that, that they would be lost to hell as well. Well, that's just a perfect answer. Um, my church believes heaven and hell are real places. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And uh, guess which one you're going to if you keep this up. Oh, dude. Well, uh, just, just, See, here we go. Just this, why, why do you want to be our enemy? I mean, why do you, on, on purpose, choose to think bad things about us? What's wrong I'm, with you? It, I'm sorry. You know, uh, it, the Bible Never mind the freaking about... Bible. The, 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 it, do you want to be a person who can get along well with others or not? Or do you want to... You know, partition yourself off into some little subgroup where if people aren't in that group with you, then they're bad. What's wrong with you? Why, 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 why is this appealing? You want to you wanna believe that me and Matt, who are not hurting anybody but just stating our opinion on TV, that we deserve to be tortured forever? That's what you want? Cut it out. Uh, just relax. We're, we're a New Testament church, and, and the book is pretty clear about... Sure. Well, there's your mistake. What? Why? Okay, I, I understand your position. I, I understand that you believe this, and you believe it because the Bible says so. Why should anybody else believe it? I mean, well, uh, I, I, mean I guess and, that's and, the reason I called, really, is, is to um, defend the faith. And the Bible says you should defend the faith. Yeah, and, uh, I, go ahead. I, I understand that, you know, First Peter 3.15, I got you. We're on the same page there. I understand what the book says. What I asked was why anybody else should believe it. Because the reason that I'm no longer a Christian is because I finally came to the understanding that my beliefs were without rational justification and without evidentiary support. So, now, and, I, and I'll go a step further, further, that even if the Bible were true, even if it were, and I don't for a second think it is, and nobody has yet been able to come close to demonstrating that it's true, um, that still does not put one in a position where they are worshiping out of anything but fear of a monster that is grotesque and wants to punish people for its own problems. Now, setting aside all that, why should anybody believe what you believe? There are a million different reasons give to us believe your best one. not just yeah, that just God us, is real, but that Christianity is the only one. way to God. Just sure. give us your best reason. What's the best reason? <sighs> well, um, it's, it's sort of what, what exactly... Uh, what exactly am I trying, am I trying to demonstrate here? Uh, just that... Uh, why are you a Christian? What is the main reason why you are a Christian? Well, um, there's a lot of evidence that the Bible was divinely inspired. Such as? So, yeah. Um, there is prophecy. No, no, such as. So, what, what is, where, where is... Give us a piece of evidence that shows that the Bible is divinely inspired. Okay, um, the Bible says things about about um, about nature that uh, weren't widely known at the time. How do you know? And and what? Like, give me an example first of all. Well, because we're talking about example, we're, we're talking about a book. Yeah. Uh, oh no. no. Uh, first of all, Matt Slick's called in. Um, the nonsense at Carm.org has been refuted. I don't know how many times. But we're talking about a book that, if you actually take it literally, do you think the world is six to ten thousand years old? Well. Um, there's a lot of interpretation. That's, that's an easy um, yes or no question. Do you think the world is closer to six to 10,000 years old or closer to 3.5 billion years old? Well, um, I, I guess if you, if, you, um, if you take it literally, yeah, the world is uh, closer to six to 10,000 years old. Matt asked you specifically what you believe. Because we're, we're trying to get at well, what is the main reason why you're a Christian, and you're dancing all around. Why can't you tell us? If you, if you, listen, if you listen back to the way you just answered the, to that, or tried to answer, or actually tried to avoid answering that last question, all I was asking was what you think, and we were going to go from there. But I, I'm, I'm happy enough with your answer that, yes, a literal view would make it six to 10,000 years old. So clearly, either you think it's six to 10,000 years old, or you're not completely a literalist. 
Um, but irrespective of what your position is, do you at least acknowledge that all of the scientific evidence points to an Earth that is vastly older than six to 10,000 years old? Yeah, I'm aware of that. Okay, so how do you reconcile- It doesn't prove there's no God. But... You're right, you're right. Did I say it did? I'm not saying that that proves there's no God. What I'm saying is, here's something we've learned about the universe and it doesn't match with your literal view of the Bible. Now there's a conflict there, and we need to resolve that. And some people resolve it in favor of the Bible, saying the Bible's absolutely right, and ignore whatever actual evidence is presented there. Um, I find that to be patently absurd because it, it turns Christianity into a self-contradictory proposition, which is, and so by the way, does the entire idea of a revelation in the New Testament. because. Your, posi your position, uh, to, to the extent that I understand it, because I haven't got a kind of a straight answer yet, is one where there is a God who has an important message for mankind, and somehow he only reveals it to certain individuals who then write this down, and thousands of years after this initial revelation, we have to rely on copies of copies of translations of copies by anonymous authors with no originals, and the a textual testimony to a miracle for example the loaves and fishes there's no amount of reports anecdotal testimonial reports that could be sufficient to justify believing that this event actually happened as reported no amount and anything that would qualify as a god would clearly understand this and if it wanted to convey this information to people in a way that was believable would not be relying on text to, to do so. And this, for me, is the nail in the coffin for Christianity. You, the, 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 God that, the God that Christians believe in is amazingly stupid if it wants to actually achieve its goal of spreading this information to humanity by relying on text, by relying on languages that die off, by relying on anecdotal testimony. That's not a pathway to truth. And anything that would qualify for a God should know this, which means either that God doesn't exist or it doesn't care enough about those people who understand the nature of evidence to actually present it. Now, which of those possibilities do you think is, is accurate? I think you, you do need faith to believe it. Sure. And but that... why would you believe anything on faith? Faith isn't a pathway to truth. Everybody's, every religion has some sort of faith. People take things on, you know, if faith is your pathway, you can't distinguish between Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, any of these others. How, how, how is it that you use reason as a path to truth in every endeavor of your life, and then when it comes to the ultimate truth, the most important truth, you're saying that faith is required? And how does that reflect on a God who supposedly exists and wants you to have this information? What kind of God requires faith instead of evidence? Well, I think you probably have faith about a lot of things too. Like what? I have I don't I have reasonable expectations based on evidence. I have trust that has been earned. I will grant trust tentatively. I don't have faith. Faith is the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have evidence. And I mean, if you can come up with something that I believe that I don't have evidence for, guess what I'll do? I'll stop believing it. That's the nature of a rational mind. That is, the, that is the goal. My only goal was to be the best Christian I could be and represent this to people who didn't believe. And what I found, because I actually cared about whether or not my beliefs were true rather than whether they felt good, was that my beliefs weren't justified. Try as I might and pray as hard as I could. No answer comes. No evidence is forthcoming. And when I talk to people about this, the only answer they ever offer is the one you did which is, well, you just got to have faith. Well, sorry, I don't. And not only do, well, I'm not sorry that I don't, I'm sorry for others that they think that, that I should have, because faith is not a virtue. Faith is gullibility. It's yeah. evidence that determines whether or not your perception of reality is reasonable and in conjunction with the world as it is. Well, I think uh, church gives a lot of people uh, some community and some values. Sure. So what? That has no tie to the, the truth of the supernatural claims. Church religions and churches have tons and tons of benefits for the in-group. And some of them even have benefits for some of the out-groups with, you know, feeding the homeless. Although I really wish 
as many of the atheists do. We have the Atheists Helping the Homeless group in Austin, where we will actually help the homeless without making them sit through a sermon first. Um, you know, it's, we're not holding their sandwich ransom in the name of Jesus. That you can do, there's no good thing that a church or religion does that cannot be achieved by purely secular means. And there's no benefit, positive benefit, of churches and religions that necessarily demonstrates the truth of their supernatural claims. But there, but there is, and this is my personal hobby horse today, there is a cost to deciding that you're going to take, uh, um, um, in particular, Christianity on faith. And that is that when you run into folks like us who don't believe it, you are compelled, because you have decided to believe Christianity, you are compelled to think all kinds of horrific things about us and, 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 and tell us that, uh, or come at us with these threats of eternal torment, um, which just draws a, you know, an insurmountable line between us. Yeah, or we, cannot be, we cannot be friends because of what you have decided to take on faith. That's the cost. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, that, that divisive cost um, plays out not only in the previous caller who had to give up his job because of good-intentioned Christians, but I have a fiancé sitting in the room um, who is essentially estranged from a good portion of her family who consider me to be the devil. Now, I may not be a perfect person, far from it, but I'm generally a good person and a caring person, and I do whatever I can to live the best life I can. I certainly am not, uh, well, I, I guess if I was the devil, this is exactly what he would say. Um, so who knows? Uh, but the absurdity of the divisive nature of Christianity in particular, and by the way, I'm an atheist with regard to all gods, uh, but since you're kind of representing Christianity, it, it just, I mean, it breaks my heart. People who actually understand what love is, people who actually understand what morality is, people who actually understand reality, it, it, it is almost unbearable to watch the people that you love be so absolutely duped into a divisive, hateful religion that they think is not divisive, they think it's inclusive, and they think it's positive. It, it kills me, and it's one of the reasons that I do this. Because I, for 25 plus years, believed this stuff. I am so happy, so happy, that I no longer think that my former roommate is destined for hell. I am so happy that despite the fact that my relationship with my parents, the nature of it has changed, I don't have to worry about them. The division is entirely one-sided. I didn't end relationships when I became an atheist. Christians ended those relationships, and it was because their particular religion cannot tolerate. My, my, I, was, I had letters from people who said, we can no longer associate with you. You are of the devil. Now, it's possible that they're right. It's possible. I don't know, I don't know under what circumstances. But the only way that you could demonstrate that is with reason and evidence, and not faith. And I don't know how we can fix a world where people have been so convinced that they are doing the right thing out of compassion and love and trying to help people when it is absolute poison, when it is absolutely destructive. I, I wish everybody could go through what I went through so they could have a, a proper understanding of, wow, how the heck could I have believed those things that I believed? And how much better life is when you want to deal with reality on reality's terms. I mean, I know that we didn't give you a huge opportunity to, to express your views, but every time I asked, I got kind of a dance. And I'm, I'm happy to have you call back in. But if your whole position is that the foundation of your belief is necessarily dependent on faith, then we got nothing to talk about. Because I don't think that that's a good thing. And until you demonstrate that faith is a good thing, how could you possibly convince somebody? And, and by the way, how do you go about demonstrating that faith is a good thing without evidence? It all comes back to reason and evidence. I think he's gone again. All right. I was going to give him the last word. <laughs> we only got uh, three minutes and 15 seconds left or so. Um, you want to do one more? Sure. Let's see. Um, sure. We'll do uh, Joe in Seattle. 
Hello. Hey, Matt, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Joe? Hey, Joe. Hey, guys, I called last week. I was so excited about calling that I, uh, I kind of just blabbered on, and you guys let me off the phone really quick. Well, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, you guys are doing a great job. I appreciate it. I, uh, a newly atheist after 35 years of being brainwashed, and I just want to let you know you guys are doing a great job. I, uh, I was just listening to you guys talk about losing friends, and ever since I've uh, been an atheist and, and been reasonably thinking and, and ask questions, people uh, kind of don't want to hang out anymore. And uh, I'm kind of in the same boat. Uh, I was just going to ask a question. Uh, how do you guys deal? I mean, how did you deal with I know it's been really tough for me to deal with uh, thinking that there's no afterlife. I've kind of come to a conclusion that um, there's no heaven now. So basically it kind of makes you feel better because you know you have to live this life the best you possibly can uh, now. Uh, based on the evidence that there is no afterlife, yeah, not, or there's not, no can I, place to go that you got to take care of the place you I, already have here. Can I cut in? Me, I, I was just going to ask you a question. How do you guys feel about the, not having an afterlife to go to? Because that's the toughest part for me to last six or seven months sure. uh, being an atheist. Okay. Uh, death sucks. I'm against that. But if... Um, <laughs> If, uh, if there's no souls or anything, then, then mortality is essentially an engineering problem. And the thing that we should be doing is supporting medical research into human life extension. So that's what I do. And, and my, my, my quick take on the afterlife, because we're running out of time, is that um, uh, religion gives you a disease and then offers you the cure. It, it <laughs> essentially convinces you that life is worthless unless there's an afterlife and then it offers you an afterlife. And once I realized um, that I hadn't actually lost anything real, um, then you know, I was fine with it. It would be like, you know, if for 25 years I believed I had a secret bank account with a billion dollars in it, and when I got to, to <laughs> age, you know, 26 or whatever, I found out that that bank account never existed in the first place. Would I feel depressed for a while that I had lost, you know, a billion dollars? Sure. And then eventually I'd realize, oh, you never had the billion dollars, so what you lost was this fictitious promise of a billion dollars, which is exactly right. what you've lost right. when you give up that afterlife. That, that doesn't mean that it wouldn't be nice to have a billion dollars, yeah. but the thing to do no, when you realize you don't have it is start working to accumulate <laughs> it, not, <laughs> not, to get all, not to get all depressed because you don't have it. Yeah, and on that note, and on that note Joe, we've got to stop because we've reached the end of the hour, but I appreciate the call. Thanks to everybody who uh, called in today, and thanks for helping us work out more of the issues of the phone. We'll do more. Uh, to see if we can't correct some of that. Uh, Steve Elliott, Dump well, I'm not going to read them all off because it went by too quick. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye, folks.